Part One, Chapter One of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part One, Chapter One. We were in class when the headmaster came in, followed by a new fellow, not wearing the school uniform, and a school servant carrying a large desk. Those who had been asleep woke up, and every one rose as if just surprised at his work. The headmaster made a sign to us to sit down. Then, turning to the classmaster, he said to him in a low voice, Monsieur Roger, here is a pupil whom I recommend to your care. He'll be in the second. If his work and conduct are satisfactory, he will go into one of the upper classes, as becomes his age. The new fellow, standing in the corner behind the door, so that he could hardly be seen, was a country lad of about fifteen, and taller than any of us. His hair was cut square on his forehead, like a village chorister's. He looked reliable, but very ill at ease. Although he was not broad-shouldered, his short school jacket of green cloth with black buttons must have been tight above the armholes, and showed at the opening of the cuffs red wrists accustomed to being bare. His legs, in blue stockings, looked out from beneath yellow trousers, drawn tight by braces. He wore stout, ill-cleaned, hobnailed boots. We began repeating the lesson. He listened with all his ears, as attentive as if at a sermon, not daring even to cross his legs or lean on his elbow, and when at two o'clock the bell rang, the master was obliged to tell him to fall into line with the rest of us. When we came back to work, we were in the habit of throwing our caps on the ground, so as to have our hands more free. We used from the door to toss them under the form, so that they hit against the wall and made a lot of dust. It was the thing." but whether he had not noticed the trick, or did not dare to attempt it, the new fellow was still holding his cap on his knees, even after prayers were over. It was one of those headgears of composite order, in which we can find traces of the bearskin, shako, billycock hat, sealskin cap, and cotton nightcap, one of those poor things, in fine, whose dumb ugliness has depths of expression, like an imbecile's face. Oval, stiffened with whalebone, it began with three round knobs. Then came in succession lozenges of velvet and rabbit skin, separated by a red band. After that a sort of bag that ended in a cardboard polygon, covered with complicated braiding, from which hung, at the end of a long, thin cord, small twisted gold threads in the manner of a tassel. The cap was new, its peak shone. "'Rise,' said the master." He stood up, his cap fell, the whole class began to laugh. He stooped to pick it up. A neighbour knocked it down again with his elbow. He picked it up once more. "'Get rid of your helmet,' said the master, who was a bit of a wag. There was a burst of laughter from the boys, which so thoroughly put the poor lad out of countenance, that he did not know whether to keep his cap in his hand, leave it on the ground, or put it on his head. He sat down again, and placed it on his knee. "'Rise,' repeated the master, "'and tell me your name.' The new boy articulated in a stammering voice an unintelligible name. "'Again!' The same sputtering of syllables was heard, drowned by the tittering of the class. "'Louder!' cried the master. "'Louder!' The new fellow then took a supreme resolution, opened an inordinately large mouth, and shouted at the top of his voice, as if calling someone in, the word, Shabavari. A hubbub broke out, rose in crescendo, with bursts of shrill voices. They yelled, barked, stamped, repeated, Shabavari! Shabavari! Then died away into single notes, growing quieter only with great difficulty, and now and again suddenly recommencing along the line of a form, whence rose here and there, like a damp cracker going off, a stifled laugh. However, amid a rain of impositions, order was gradually re-established in the class, and the master, having succeeded in catching the name of Charles Bovary, having had it dictated to him, 
spelt out and re-read, at once ordered the poor devil to go and sit down on the punishment form at the foot of the master's desk. He got up, but before going, hesitated. "'What are you looking for?' asked the master. "'My C.A.P.' timidly said the new fellow, casting troubled looks around him. Five hundred lines for all the class!' shouted in a furious voice, stopped, like the quos ego, a fresh outburst. "'Silence!' continued the master indignantly, wiping his brow with his handkerchief, which he had just taken from his cap. "'As to you, new boy, you will conjugate ridiculous sum twenty times.' Then, in a gentler tone, "'Come, you'll find your cap again. It hasn't been stolen.' Quiet was restored. Heads bent over desks, and the new fellow remained for two hours in an exemplary attitude, although from time to time some paper pellet flipped from the tip of a pen came bang in his face. But he wiped his face with one hand, and continued motionless, his eyes lowered. In the evening, at preparation, he pulled out his pens from his desk, arranged his small belongings, and carefully ruled his paper. We saw him working conscientiously, looking up every word in the dictionary, and taking the greatest pains. Thanks, no doubt, to the willingness he showed, he had not to go down to the class below. But though he knew his rules passably, he had little finish in composition. It was the curé of his village who had taught him his first Latin, his parents, from motives of economy, having sent him to school as late as possible. His father, Monsieur Charles Denis Bartholomé Bovary, retired assistant surgeon major, compromised about 1812 in certain conscription scandals, and forced at this time to leave the service, had taken advantage of his fine figure to get hold of a dowry of 60,000 francs that offered in the person of a hosier's daughter, who had fallen in love with his good looks. A fine man, a great talker, making his spurs ring as he walked, wearing whiskers that ran into his moustache, his fingers always garnished with rings and dressed in loud colours, he had the dash of a military man, with the easy go of a commercial traveller. Once married, he lived for three or four years on his wife's fortune, dining well, rising late, smoking long porcelain pipes, not coming in at night till after the theatre, and haunting cafes. The father-in-law died, leaving little, he was indignant at this, went in for the business, lost some money in it, then retired to the country, where he thought he would make money. But as he knew no more about farming than calico, as he rode his horses instead of sending them to plough, drank his cider in bottle instead of selling it in cask, ate the finest poultry in his farmyard, and greased his hunting boots with the fat of his pigs, he was not long in finding out that he would do better to give up all speculation. For two hundred francs a year he managed to live on the border of the provinces of Caux and Picardy, in a kind of place half farm, half private house, and here, soured, eaten up with regrets, cursing his luck, jealous of every one, he shut himself up at the age of forty-five, sick of men, he said, and determined to live at peace. His wife had adored him once on a time. She had bored him with a thousand servilities that had only estranged him the more. Lively once, expansive and affectionate, in growing older she had become, after the fashion of wine, that exposed to air turns to vinegar, ill-tempered, grumbling, irritable. She had suffered so much without complaint at first, until she had seen him going after all the village drabs, and until a score of bad houses sent him back to her at night, weary, stinking drunk. Then her pride revolted. After that she was silent, burying her anger in a dumb stoicism that she maintained till her death. She was constantly going about looking after business matters. She called on the lawyers, the president, remembered when bills fell due, got them renewed, and at home ironed, sewed, washed, looked after the workmen, paid the accounts, while he, troubling himself about nothing, eternally besotted in sleepy sulkiness, whence he only roused himself to say disagreeable things to her, sat smoking by the fire and spitting into the cinders. When she had a child it had to be sent out to nurse. When he came home the lad was spoilt as if he were a prince. 
his mother stuffed him with jam, his father let him run about barefoot, and playing the philosopher, even said he might as well go about quite naked, like the young of animals. As opposed to the maternal ideas, he had a certain virile idea of childhood, on which he sought to mould his son, wishing him to be brought up hardily, like a Spartan, to give him a strong constitution. He sent him to bed without any fire, taught him to drink off large draughts of rum, and to jeer at religious processions. But, peaceable by nature, the lad answered only poorly to his notions. His mother always kept him near her. She cut out cardboard for him, told him tales, entertained him with endless monologues full of melancholy gaiety and charming nonsense. In her life's isolation she centred on the child's head all her shattered, broken little vanities. She dreamt of high station. She already saw him, tall, handsome, clever, settled as an engineer or in the law. She taught him to read, and even on an old piano she had taught him two or three little songs. But to all this Monsieur Bovary, caring little for letters, said, It was not worth while. Would they ever have the means to send him to a public school, to buy him a practice, or start him in business? Besides, with cheek a man always gets on in the world. Madame Bovary bit her lips, and the child knocked about the village. He went after the labourers, drove away with clods of earth the ravens that were flying about. He ate blackberries along the hedges, minded the geese with a long switch, went haymaking during harvest, ran about in the woods, played hopscotch under the church porch on rainy days, and at great fates begged the beadle to let him toll the bells, that he might hang all his weight on the long rope and feel himself borne upward by it in its swing. Meanwhile he grew like an oak. He was strong on hand, fresh of colour. When he was twelve years old, his mother had her own way. He began lessons. The curé took him in hand, but the lessons were so short and irregular that they could not be of much use. They were given at spare moments in the sacristy, standing up hurriedly between a baptism and a burial, or else the curé, if he had not to go out, sent for his pupil after the Angelus. They went up to his room and settled down. The flies and moths fluttered round the candle. It was close. The child fell asleep, and the good man, beginning to doze with his hands on his stomach, was soon snoring with his mouth wide open. On other occasions, when Monsieur le Curé, on his way back after administering the viaticum to some sick person in the neighbourhood, caught sight of Charles playing about the fields, he called him, lectured him for a quarter of an hour, and took advantage of the occasion to make him conjugate his verb at the foot of a tree. The rain interrupted them, or an acquaintance passed. All the same, he was always pleased with him, and even said, the young man had a very good memory. Charles could not go on like this. Madame Bovary took strong steps. Ashamed, or rather tired out, Monsieur Bovary gave in without a struggle, and they waited one year longer, so that the lad should take his first communion. Six months more passed, and the year after, Charles was finally sent to school at Rouen where his father took him towards the end of October, at the time of the St. Romain Fair. It would now be impossible for any of us to remember anything about him. He was a youth of even temperament, who played in playtime, worked in school hours, was attentive in class, slept well in the dormitory, and ate well in the refectory. He had, in loco parentis, a wholesale ironmonger in the Rue Ganterie, who took him out once a month on Sundays, after his shop was shut, sent him for a walk on the quay to look at the boats, and then brought him back to college at seven o'clock before supper. Every Thursday evening he wrote a long letter to his mother, with red ink and three wafers. Then he went over his history notebooks, or read an old volume of Anarchasis that was knocking about the study. When he went for walks he talked to the servant, who, like himself, came from the country. By dint of hard work he kept always about the middle of the class, once even he got a certificate in natural history, but at the end of his third year his parents withdrew him from the school to make him study medicine, convinced that he could even take his degree by himself. His mother chose a room for him in the fourth floor of a dyer's she knew, overlooking the Eau de Robec. She made arrangements for his board, 
got him furniture, a table and two chairs, sent home for an old cherry-tree bedstead, and bought besides a small cast-iron stove, with the supply of wood that was to warm the poor child. Then at the end of a week she departed, after a thousand injunctions, to be good now that he was going to be left to himself. The syllabus that he read on the notice-board stunned him. Lectures on anatomy, lectures on pathology, lectures on physiology, lectures on pharmacy, lectures on botany and clinical medicine, and therapeutics without counting hygiene and materia medica, all names of whose etymologies he was ignorant, and that were to him as so many doors to sanctuaries filled with magnificent darkness. He understood nothing of it all. It was all very well to listen. He did not follow. Still he worked. He had bound notebooks. He attended all the courses, never missed a single lecture. He did his little daily task like a mill-horse, who goes round and round, with his eyes bandaged, not knowing what work he is doing. To spare him expense, his mother sent him every week by the carrier a piece of veal baked in the oven, with which he lunched when he came back from the hospital, while he sat kicking his feet against the wall. After this he had to run off to lectures, to the operation room, to the hospital, and return to his home at the other end of the town. In the evening, after the poor dinner of his landlord, he went back to his room, and set to work again in his wet clothes, which smoked as he sat in front of the hot stove. On the fine summer evenings, at the time when the close streets are empty, when the servants are playing shuttlecock at the doors, he opened his window and leant out. The river that makes of this quarter of Rouen a wretched little Venice flowed beneath him between the bridges and the railings, yellow, violet, or blue. Working men kneeling on the banks washed their bare arms in the water. On poles projecting from the attics, skeins of cotton were drying in the air. Opposite, beyond the roofs, spread the pure heaven with the red sun setting. How pleasant it must be at home! How fresh under the beech tree! and he expanded his nostrils to breathe in the sweet odours of the country which did not reach him. He grew thin, his figure became taller, his face took a saddened look that made it nearly interesting. Naturally, through indifference, he abandoned all the resolutions he had made. Once he missed a lecture, the next day all the lectures, and enjoying his idleness little by little, he gave up work altogether. He got into the habit of going to the public house, and had a passion for dominoes. To shut himself up every evening in the dirty public room, to push about on marble tables the small sheep bones with black dots, seemed to him a fine proof of his freedom, which raised him in his own esteem. It was beginning to see life, the sweetness of stolen pleasures, and when he entered he put his hand on the door-handle with a joy almost sensual. Then many things hidden within him came out. He learnt couplets by heart, and sang them to his boon companions, became enthusiastic about Béranger, learnt how to make punch, and finally how to make love. Thanks to these preparatory labours, he failed completely in his examination for an ordinary degree. He was expected home the same night to celebrate his success. He started on foot, stopped at the beginning of the village, sent for his mother, and told her all. She excused him, threw the blame of his failure on the injustice of the examiners, encouraged him a little, and took upon herself to set matters straight. It was only five years later that Monsieur Bovary knew the truth. It was old then, and he accepted it. Moreover, he could not believe that a man born of him could be a fool. So Charles set to work again, and crammed for his examination, ceaselessly learning all the old questions by heart. He passed pretty well. What a happy day for his mother! They gave a grand dinner. Where should he go to practice? To Tost, where there was only one old doctor. For a long time Madame Bovary had been on the lookout for his death, and the old fellow had barely been packed off, when Charles was installed, opposite his place, as his successor. But it was not everything to have brought up a son, to have had him taught medicine, and discovered Tost where he could practice it. He must have a wife. She found him one, the widow of a bailiff at Dieppe, who was forty-five, and had an income of twelve hundred francs. Though she was ugly, 
as dry as a bone, her face with as many pimples as the spring has buds, Madame Dubuc had no lack of suitors. To attain her ends, Madame Bovary had to oust them all, and she even succeeded in very cleverly baffling the intrigues of a pork butcher backed up by the priests. Charles had seen in marriage the advent of an easier life, thinking he would be more free to do as he liked with himself and his money. But his wife was master. He had to say this, and not say that, in company, to fast every Friday, dress as she liked, harass at her bidding those patients who did not pay. She opened his letters, watched his comings and goings, and listened at the partition wall when women came to consult him in his surgery. She must have her chocolate every morning, attentions without end. She constantly complained of her nerves, her chest, her liver. The noise of footsteps made her ill. When people left her, solitude became odious to her. If they came back, it was doubtless to see her die. When Charles returned in the evening, she stretched forth two long, thin arms from beneath the sheets, put them round his neck, and having made him sit down on the edge of the bed, began to talk to him of her troubles. He was neglecting her. He loved another. She had been warned she would be unhappy, and she ended by asking him for a dose of medicine and a little more love. End of chapter 1part 1 chapter 2 of madame bovary this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org madame bovary by gustave flaubert translated by elena marx aveling part 1 chapter 2 one night, towards eleven o'clock, they were awakened by the noise of a horse pulling up outside their door. The servant opened the garret window, and parleyed for some time with a man in the street below. He came for the doctor, had a letter for him. Nastasi came downstairs shivering, and undid the bars and bolts, one after the other. The man left his horse, and following the servant, suddenly came in behind her. He pulled out from his wool cap with grey top-knots a letter wrapped up in a rag and presented it gingerly to Charles, who rested on his elbow on the pillow to read it. Nastasi, standing near the bed, held the light. Madame, in modesty, had turned to the wall and showed only her back. This letter, sealed with a small seal in blue wax, begged Monsieur Bovary to come immediately to the farm of the Berto to set a broken leg. Now from Tost to the Berto was a good eighteen miles across country, by way of Longueville and Saint-Victor. It was a dark night. Madame Bovary, Jr., was afraid of accidents for her husband. So it was decided the stable-boy should go on first. Charles would start three hours later, when the moon rose. A boy was to be sent to meet him, and show him the way to the farm, and open the gates for him. Towards four o'clock in the morning, Charles, well wrapped up in his cloak, set out for the Berteau. Still sleepy from the warmth of his bed, he let himself be lulled by the quiet trot of his horse. When it stopped of its own accord in front of those holes surrounded with thorns that are dug on the margin of furrows, Charles awoke with a start, suddenly remembered the broken leg, and tried to call to mind all the fractures he knew. The rain had stopped, day was breaking, and on the branches of the leafless trees birds roosted motionless, their little feathers bristling in the cold morning wind. The flat country stretched as far as I could see, and the tufts of trees round the farms at long intervals seemed like dark violet stains on the vast grey surface that on the horizon faded into the gloom of the sky. Charles, from time to time, opened his eyes, his mind grew weary, and sleep coming upon him, he soon fell into a doze, wherein, his recent sensations blending with memories, he became conscious of a double self, at once student and married man, lying in his bed as but now, and crossing the operation theatre as of old. The warm smell of poultices mingled in his brain with the fresh odour of dew. 
he heard the iron rings rattling along the curtain rods of the bed, and saw his wife sleeping. As he passed Vassonville, he came upon a boy sitting on the grass at the edge of a ditch. "'Are you the doctor?' asked the child, and on Charles's answer he took his wooden shoes in his hands and ran on in front of him. The general practitioner, riding along, gathered from his guide's talk that Monsieur Rouault must be one of the well-to-do farmers. He had broken his leg the evening before on his way home from a twelfth-night feast at a neighbour's. His wife had been dead for two years. There was with him only his daughter, who helped him to keep house. The ruts were becoming deeper. They were approaching the Berteau. The little lad, slipping through a hole in the hedge, disappeared. Then he came back to the end of a courtyard to open the gate. The horse slipped on the wet grass. Charles had to stoop to pass under the branches. The watchdogs in their kennels barked, dragging at their chains. As he entered the Berteau, the horse took fright and stumbled. It was a substantial-looking farm. In the stables, over the top of the open doors, one could see great cart-horses quietly feeding from new racks. Right along the outbuildings extended a large dunghill, from which manure liquid oozed, while amidst fowls and turkeys, five or six peacocks, a luxury in Chauchua farmyards, were foraging on the top of it. The sheepfold was long, the barn high, with walls smooth as your hand. Under the cart-shed were two large carts, and four ploughs, with their whips, shafts, and harnesses complete, whose fleeces of blue wool were getting soiled by the fine dust that fell from the granaries. The courtyard sloped upwards, planted with trees set out symmetrically, and the chattering noise of a flock of geese was heard near the pond. A young woman in a blue merino dress, with three flounces, came to the threshold of the door to receive Monsieur Bovary, whom she led to the kitchen, where a large fire was blazing. The servant's breakfast was boiling beside it in small pots of all sizes. Some damp clothes were drying inside the chimney-corner. The shovel, tongs, and the nozzle of the bellows, all of colossal size, shone like polished steel, while along the walls hung many pots and pans, in which the clear flame of the hearth, mingling with the first rays of the sun coming in through the window, was mirrored fitfully. Charles went up to the first floor to see the patient. He found him in his bed, sweating under his bedclothes, having thrown his cotton nightcap right away from him. He was a fat little man of fifty, with white skin and blue eyes, the fore part of his head bald, and he wore earrings. By his side on a chair stood a large decanter of brandy, whence he poured himself a little from time to time, to keep up his spirits. But as soon as he caught sight of the doctor, his elation subsided, and instead of swearing, as he had been doing for the last twelve hours, he began to groan freely. The fracture was a simple one, without any kind of complication. Charles could not have hoped for an easier case. Then, calling to mind the devices of his masters at the bedsides of patients, he comforted the sufferer with all sorts of kindly remarks, those caresses of the surgeon that are like the oil they put on bistouris. In order to make some splints, a bundle of laths was brought up from the cart-house. Charles selected one, cut it into two pieces, and planed it with a fragment of window-pane, while the servant tore up sheets to make bandages, and Mademoiselle Emma tried to sew some pads. As she was a long time before she found her work-case, her father grew impatient. She did not answer, but as she sewed she pricked her fingers, which she then put to her mouth to suck them. Charles was surprised at the whiteness of her nails. They were shiny, delicate at the tips, more polished than the ivory of Dieppe, and almond-shaped. Yet her hand was not beautiful, perhaps not white enough, and a little hard at the knuckles. Besides, it was too long, with no soft inflections in the outlines. Her real beauty was in her eyes. Although brown, they seemed black because of the lashes, and her look came at you frankly with a candid boldness. The bandaging over, the doctor was invited by Monsieur Rouault himself to pick a bit before he left. Charles went down into the room on the ground floor. 
Knives and forks and silver goblets were laid for two on a little table at the foot of a huge bed that had a canopy of printed cotton with figures representing Turks. There was an odour of iris root and damp sheets that escaped from a large oak chest opposite the window. On the floor in corners were sacks of flour stuck upright in rows. These were the overflow from the neighbouring granary, to which three stone steps led. By way of decoration for the apartment, hanging to a nail in the middle of the wall, whose green paint scaled off from the effects of the saltpetre, was a crayon head of Minerva in gold frame, underneath which was written in Gothic letters, To Dear Papa. First they spoke of the patient, then of the weather, of the great cold, of the wolves that infested the fields at night. Mademoiselle Rouault did not at all like the country especially now that she had to look after the farm almost alone. As the room was chilly, she shivered as she ate. This showed something of her full lips, that she had a habit of biting when silent. Her neck stood out from a white turned-down collar. Her hair, whose two black folds seemed each of a single piece, so smooth were they, was parted in the middle by a delicate line that curved slightly with the curve of the head and just showing the tip of the ear, it was joined behind in a thick chignon, with a wavy movement at the temples that the country doctor saw now for the first time in his life. The upper part of her cheek was rose-coloured. She had, like a man, thrust in between two buttons of her bodice a tortoise-shell eyeglass. When Charles, after bidding farewell to old Rouault, returned to the room before leaving, he found her standing, her forehead against the window, looking into the garden, where the bean-props had been knocked down by the wind. She turned round. "'Are you looking for anything?' she asked. "'My whip, if you please,' he answered. He began rummaging on the bed, behind the doors, under the chairs. It had fallen to the floor between the sacks and the wall. Mademoiselle Emma saw it, and bent over the flower-sacks. Charles, out of politeness, made a dash also, and as he stretched out his arm, at the same moment felt his breast brush against the back of the young girl bending beneath him. She drew herself up, scarlet, and looked at him over her shoulder as she handed him his whip. Instead of returning to the Berteau in three days, as he had promised, he went back the very next day, then regularly twice a week, without counting the visits he paid now and then, as if by accident. Everything, moreover, went well. The patient progressed favourably, and when, at the end of forty-six days, old Rouault was seen trying to walk alone in his den, Monsieur Bovary began to be looked upon as a man of great capacity. Old Rouault said that he could not have been cured better by the first doctor of Yvetot, or even of Rouen. As to Charles, he did not stop to ask himself why it was a pleasure to him to go to the Berteau. Had he done so, he would, no doubt, have attributed his zeal to the importance of the case, or perhaps to the money he hoped to make by it. Was it for this, however, that his visits to the farm formed a delightful exception to the meagre occupations of his life? On these days he rose early, set off at a gallop, urging on his horse, then got down to wipe his boots in the grass and put on black gloves before entering. He liked going into the courtyard, and noticing the gate turn against his shoulder, the cock crow on the wall, the lads run to meet him. He liked the granary and the stables. He liked old Rouault, who pressed his hand and called him his saviour. He liked the small wooden shoes of Mademoiselle Emma on the scoured flags of the kitchen. Her high heels made her a little taller, and when she walked in front of him, the wooden sole springing up quickly, struck with a sharp sound against the leather of her boots. She always accompanied him to the first step of the stairs. When his horse had not yet been brought round, she stayed there. They had said good-bye. There was no more talking. The open air wrapped her round, playing with the soft down on the back of her neck, or blew to and fro on her hips the apron-strings that fluttered like streamers. Once, during a thaw, the bark of the trees in the yard was oozing, the snow on the roofs of the outbuildings was melting. She stood on the threshold and went to fetch her sunshade, and opened it. The sunshade of silk of the colour of pigeons' breasts, through which the sun shone, lighted up with shifting hues the white skin of her face. She smiled under the tender warmth, 
and drops of water could be heard falling one by one on the stretched silk. During the first period of Charles's visits to the Berthaud, Madame Bovary, Jr., never failed to inquire after the invalid, and she had even chosen in the book that she kept on a system of double entry a clean blank page for Monsieur Rouault. But when she heard he had a daughter, she began to make inquiries, and she learnt that Mademoiselle Rouault, brought up at the Ursuline convent, had received what is called a good education, and so knew dancing, geography, drawing, how to embroider, and play the piano. That was the last straw. So it is for this, she said to herself, that his face beams when he goes to see her, and that he puts on his new waistcoat at the risk of spoiling it with the rain. Ah, that woman, that woman! And she detested her instinctively. At first she solaced herself by allusions that Charles did not understand, then by casual observations that he let pass for fear of a storm, finally by open apostrophes to which he knew not what to answer. Why did he go back to the Berteau, now that Monsieur Rouault was cured, and that these folks hadn't paid yet? Ah, it was because a young lady was there, someone who knew how to talk, to embroider, to be witty. That was what he cared about. He wanted town misses. And she went on. The daughter of old Rouault, a town miss? Get out! Their grandfather was a shepherd, and they have a cousin who was almost up at the assizes for a nasty blow in a quarrel. It is not worth while making such a fuss, or showing herself at church on Sundays in a silk gown like a countess. Besides, the poor old chap, if it hadn't been for the causa last year, would have had much ado to pay up his arrears. For very weariness, Charles left off going to the Berteau. Eloise made him swear, his hand on the prayer-book, that he would go there no more, after much sobbing and many kisses, in a great outburst of love. He obeyed then, but the strength of his desire protested against the servility of his conduct, and he thought, with a kind of naive hypocrisy, that his interdict to see her gave him a sort of right to love her. And then the widow was thin, she had long teeth, wore in all weathers a little black shawl, the edge of which hung down between her shoulder-blades. Her bony figure was sheathed in her clothes, as if they were a scabbard. They were too short, and displayed her ankles with the laces of her large boots crossed over grey stockings. Charles's mother came to see them from time to time, but after a few days the daughter-in-law seemed to put her own edge on her, and then, like two knives, they scarified him with their reflections and observations. It was wrong of him to eat so much. Why did he always offer a glass of something to every one who came? What obstinacy not to wear flannels! In the spring it came about that a notary at Angouville, the holder of the widow du Buc's property, one fine day went off, taking with him all the money in his office. Eloise, it is true, still possessed, besides a share in a boat valued at six thousand francs, her house in the Rue Saint-Francois, and yet, with all this fortune that had been so trumpeted abroad, nothing, excepting perhaps a little furniture and a few clothes, had appeared in the household. The matter had to be gone into. The house at Dieppe was found to be eaten up with mortgages to its foundations. What she had placed with the notary, God only knew, and her share in the boat did not exceed one thousand crowns. She had lied, the good lady. In his exasperation, Monsieur Bovary the Elder, smashing a chair on the flags, accused his wife of having caused misfortune to the son by harnessing him to such a harridan, whose harness wasn't worth her hide. They came to Tost. Explanations followed. There were scenes— Eloise, in tears, throwing her arms about her husband, implored him to defend her from his parents. Charles tried to speak up for her. They grew angry and left the house. But the blow had struck home. A week after, as she was hanging up some washing in her yard, she was seized with a spitting of blood, and the next day, while Charles had his back turned to her, drawing the window curtain, she said, "'Oh, God!' gave a sigh, and fainted. She was dead." What a surprise! When all was over at the cemetery, Charles went home. He found no one downstairs. He went up to the first floor to their room, saw her dress still hanging at the foot of the alcove, then, leaning against the writing-table, he stayed until the evening, buried in sorrowful reverie. 
She had loved him after all. End of Part 1 Chapter 2「Chapter Three of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part One, Chapter Three. One morning old Rouault brought Charles the money for setting his leg, seventy-five francs in forty sous pieces, and a turkey. He had heard of his loss, and consoled him as well as he could. "'I know what it is,' said he, clapping him on the shoulder. "'I've been through it. When I lost my dear departed, I went into the fields to be quite alone. I fell at the foot of a tree. I cried. I called on God. I talked nonsense to him.' I wanted to be like the moles that I saw on the branches, their insides swarming with worms, dead, and an end of it. And when I thought that there were others at that very moment with their nice little wives holding them in their embrace, I struck great blows on the earth with my stick. I was pretty well mad with not eating. The very idea of going to a café disgusted me. You wouldn't believe it. Well, quite softly, one day following another, a spring on a winter, and an autumn after a summer, this wore away, piece by piece, crumb by crumb. It passed away, it is gone. I should say, it has sunk, for something always remains at the bottom, as one would say, a weight here, at one's heart. But since it is the lot of all of us, one must not give way altogether, and, because others have died, want to die too. You must pull yourself together, Monsieur Bovary. It will pass away. Come to see us, my daughter thinks of you now and again, you know, and she says you are forgetting her. Spring will soon be here. We'll have some rabbit shooting in the Warrens to amuse you a bit. Charles followed his advice. He went back to the Berteau. He found all as he had left it, that is to say, as it was five months ago. The pear trees were already in blossom, and Farmer Rouault, on his legs again, came and went, making the farm more full of life. Thinking it his duty to heap the greatest attention upon the doctor, because of his sad position, he begged him not to take his hat off, spoke to him in an undertone, as if he had been ill, and even pretended to be angry because nothing rather lighter had been prepared for him than for the others, such as a little clotted cream or stewed pears. He told stories. Charles found himself laughing, but the remembrance of his wife suddenly coming back to him depressed him. Coffee was brought in. He thought no more about her. He thought less of her as he grew accustomed to living alone. The new delight of independence soon made his loneliness bearable. He could now change his meal times, go in or out without explanation, and when he was very tired, stretch himself at full length on his bed. So he nursed and coddled himself, and accepted the consolations that were offered him. On the other hand, the death of his wife had not served him ill in his business, since for a month people had been saying, The poor young man! What a loss! His name had been talked about, his practice had increased, and moreover he could go to the Berteau just as he liked. He had an aimless hope, and was vaguely happy. He thought himself better looking as he brushed his whiskers before the looking-glass. One day he got there about three o'clock. Everybody was in the fields. He went into the kitchen, but did not at once catch sight of Emma. The outside shutters were closed. Through the chinks of the wood the sun sent across the flooring long fine rays that were broken at the corners of the furniture and trembled along the ceiling. Some flies on the table were crawling up the glasses that had been used, and buzzing as they drowned themselves in the dregs of the cider. The daylight that came in by the chimney made velvet of the soot at the back of the fireplace, and touched with blue the cold cinders. Between the window and the hearth Emma was sewing. She wore no fichu. He could see small drops of perspiration on her bare shoulders. After the fashion of country folks, she asked him to have something to drink. He said no. She insisted, and at last laughingly offered to have a glass of liqueur with him. So she went to fetch a bottle of curacao from the cupboard, 
reaching down two small glasses, filled one to the brim, poured scarcely anything into the other, and after having clinked glasses, carried hers to her mouth. As it was almost empty, she bent back to drink, her head thrown back, her lips pouting, her neck on the strain. She laughed at getting none of it, while with the tip of her tongue passing between her small teeth she licked drop by drop the bottom of her glass. She sat down again and took up her work, a white cotton stocking she was darning. She worked with her head bent down. She did not speak, nor did Charles. The air coming under the door blew a little dust over the flags. He watched it drift along, and heard nothing but the throbbing in his head, and the faint clucking of a hen that had laid an egg in the yard. Emma, from time to time, cooled her cheeks with the palms of her hands, and cooled these again on the knobs of the huge fire-dogs. She complained of suffering since the beginning of the season from giddiness. She asked if sea-baths would do her any good. She began talking of her convent, Charles of his school. Words came to them. They went up into her bedroom. She showed him her old music-books, the little prizes she had won, and the oak-leaf crowns left at the bottom of a cupboard. She spoke to him, too, of her mother, of the country, and even showed him the bed in the garden, where, on the first Friday of every month, she gathered flowers to put on her mother's tomb. But the gardener they had never knew anything about it. Servants are so stupid. She would have dearly liked, if only for the winter, to live in town, although the length of the fine days made the country perhaps even more wearisome in the summer. And, according to what she was saying, her voice was clear, sharp, or, on a sudden, all languor, drawn out in modulations that ended almost in murmurs, as she spoke to herself, now joyous, opening big, naive eyes, then with her eyelids half-closed, her look full of boredom, her thoughts wandering. Going home at night, Charles went over her words one by one, trying to recall them, to fill out their sense, that he might piece out the life she had lived before he knew her. But he never saw her in his thoughts, other than he had seen her the first time, or as he had just left her. Then he asked himself, what would become of her, if she would be married, and to whom? Alas, old Rouault was rich, and she so beautiful! but Emma's face always rose before his eyes, and a monotone, like the humming of a top, sounded in his ears. "'If you should marry after all, if you should marry!' At night he could not sleep. His throat was parched. He was athirst. He got up to drink from the water-bottle, and opened the window. The night was covered with stars, a warm wind blowing in the distance. The dogs were barking. He turned his head towards Berthaud. Thinking that, after all, he should lose nothing, Charles promised himself to ask her in marriage as soon as occasion offered, but each time such occasion did offer, the fear of not finding the right words sealed his lips. Old Rouault would not have been sorry to be rid of his daughter, who was of no use to him in the house. In his heart he excused her, thinking her too clever for farming, a calling under the ban of heaven, since one never saw a millionaire in it. Far from having made a fortune by it, the good man was losing every year, for if he was good in bargaining, in which he enjoyed the dodges of the trade, on the other hand agriculture properly so called, and the internal management of the farm, suited him less than most people. He did not willingly take his hands out of his pockets, and did not spare expense in all that concerned himself, liking to eat well, to have good fires, and to sleep well. He liked old cider underdone legs of mutton, glorious well beaten up. He took his meals in the kitchen alone, opposite the fire, on a little table brought to him already laid, as on the stage. When, therefore, he perceived that Charles's cheeks grew red if near his daughter, which meant that he would propose for her one of these days, he chewed the cud of the matter beforehand. He certainly thought him a little meagre, and not quite the son-in-law he would have liked but he was said to be well brought up, economical, very learned, and no doubt would not make too many difficulties about the dowry. Now, as old Rouault would soon be forced to sell twenty-two acres of his property, as he owed a good deal to the mason, to the harness-maker, and as the shaft of the cider-press wanted renewing, if he asks for her, he said to himself, 
I'll give her to him. At Michaelmas, Charles went to spend three days at the Berteau. The last had passed, like the others, in procrastinating from hour to hour. Old Rouault was seeing him off. They were walking along the road full of ruts. They were about to part. This was the time. Charles gave himself as far as to the corner of the hedge, and at last, when past it, Monsieur Rouault, he murmured, I should like to say something to you. They stopped. Charles was silent. Well, tell me your story. Don't I know all about it? said old Rouault, laughing softly. Monsieur Rouault, Monsieur Rouault, stammered Charles. I ask nothing better, the farmer went on. Although, no doubt, the little one is of my mind, still we must ask her opinion. So you get off. I'll go back home. If it is yes, you needn't return because of all the people about, and besides it would upset her too much. But so that you mayn't be eating your heart, I'll open wide the outer shutter of the window against the wall. You can see it from the back by leaning over the hedge. And he went off. Charles fastened his horse to a tree. He ran into the road and waited. Half an hour passed. Then he counted nineteen minutes by his watch. Suddenly a noise was heard against the wall. The shutter had been thrown back. The hook was still swinging. The next day, by nine o'clock, he was at the farm. Emma blushed as he entered, and she gave a little forced laugh to keep herself in countenance. Old Rouault embraced his future son-in-law. The discussion of money matters was put off. Moreover, there was plenty of time before them, as the marriage could not decently take place till Charles was out of mourning, that is to say, about the spring of the next year. The winter passed waiting for this. Mademoiselle Rouault was busy with her trousseau. Part of it was ordered at Rouen, and she made herself chemises and nightcaps after fashion plates that she borrowed. When Charles visited the farmer, the preparations for the wedding were talked over. They wondered in what room they should have dinner. They dreamt of the number of dishes that would be wanted, and what should be entrees. Emma would, on the contrary, have preferred to have a midnight wedding with torches, but old Rouault could not understand such an idea. So there was a wedding at which forty-three persons were present, at which they remained sixteen hours at table, began again the next day, and to some extent on the days following. End of Part 1, Chapter 3「Chapter Four of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, translated by Eleanor Marx Aveling. Part One, Chapter Four. The guests arrived early in carriages, in one-horse chaises, two-wheeled cars, old open gigs, wagonettes with leather hoods, and the young people from the nearer villages in carts, in which they stood up in rows, holding on to the sides so as not to fall, going at a trot and well shaken up. Some came from a distance of thirty miles, from Goderville, from Normanville, and from Cany. All the relatives of both families had been invited, quarrels between friends arranged, acquaintances long since lost sight of, written to. From time to time one heard the crack of a whip behind the hedge, then the gates opened, and a chaise entered. Galloping up to the foot of the steps, it stopped short and emptied its load. They got down from all sides, rubbing knees and stretching arms. The ladies, wearing bonnets, had on dresses in the town fashion, gold watch-chains, pelerines with the ends tucked into belts, or little coloured fichus fastened down behind with a pin, and that left the back of the neck bare. The lads, dressed like their papas, seemed uncomfortable in their new clothes. Many that day hand-sewed their first pair of boots, and by their sides, speaking never a word, wearing the white dress of their first communion lengthened for the occasion, were some big girls of fourteen or sixteen, cousins or elder sisters, no doubt, rubicund, bewildered, their hair greasy with rose pomade, and very much afraid of dirtying their gloves. 
As there were not enough stable boys to unharness all the carriages, the gentlemen turned up their sleeves and set about it themselves. According to their different social positions, they wore tail coats, overcoats, shooting jackets, cutaway coats, fine tail coats redolent of family respectability that only came out of the wardrobe on state occasions, overcoats with long tails flapping in the wind and round capes and pockets like sacks, shooting jackets of coarse cloth, generally worn with a cap with a brass-bound peak, very short cutaway coats with two small buttons in the back, close together like a pair of eyes, and the tails of which seemed cut out of one piece by a carpenter's hatchet. Some, too, but these, you may be sure, would sit at the bottom of the table, wore their best blouses, that is to say, with collars turned down to the shoulders, the back gathered into small plates, and the waist fastened very low down with a worked belt and the shirt stood out from the chests like cuirasses. Every one had just had his hair cut, ears stood out from the heads, they had been close-shaved. A few even, who had had to get up before daybreak, and not been able to see to shave, had diagonal gashes under their noses, or cuts the size of a three-franc piece along the jaws, which the fresh air en route had inflamed so that the great white beaming faces were mottled here and there with red dabs. The mairie was a mile and a half from the farm, and they went thither on foot, returning in the same way after the ceremony in the church. The procession first united like one long-coloured scarf that undulated across the fields, along the narrow path winding amid the green corn, soon lengthened out, and broke up into different groups that loitered to talk. The fiddler walked in front with his violin, gay with ribbons at its pegs. Then came the married pair, the relations, the friends, all following pell-mell. The children stayed behind, amusing themselves, plucking the bell-flowers from oat-ears, or playing amongst themselves unseen. Emma's dress, too long, trailed a little on the ground. From time to time she stopped to pull it up, and then, delicately, with her gloved hands, she picked off the coarse grass and the thistle-downs, while Charles, empty-handed, waited till she had finished. Old Rouault, with a new silk hat and the cuffs of his black coat covering his hands up to the nails, gave his arm to Madame Bovary Senior. As to Monsieur Bovary Senior, who, heartily despising all these folk, had come simply in a frock-coat of military cut with one row of buttons, he was passing compliments of the bar to a fair young peasant. She bowed, blushed, and did not know what to say. The other wedding guests talked of their business or played tricks behind each other's backs, egging one another on in advance to be jolly. Those who listened could always catch the squeaking of the fiddler, who went on playing across the fields. When he saw that the rest were far behind, he stopped to take breath, slowly rosined his bow, so that the strings should sound more shrilly, then set off again, by turns lowering and raising his neck, the better to mark time for himself. The noise of the instrument drove away the little birds from afar. The table was laid under the cart-shed. On it were four sirloins, six chicken fricassees, stewed veal, three legs of mutton, and in the middle a fine roast suckling pig, flanked by four chitterlings with sorrel. At the corners were decanters of brandy. Sweet bottled cider frothed round the corks, and all the glasses had been filled to the brim with wine beforehand. Large dishes of yellow cream, that trembled with the least shake of the table, had designed on their smooth surface the initials of the newly wedded pair in non pareil arabesques. The confectioner of Yvetot had been entrusted with the tarts and sweets. As he had only just set up on the place, he had taken a lot of trouble, and at dessert he himself brought in a set dish that evoked loud cries of wonderment. To begin with, at its base, there was a square of blue cardboard, representing a temple with porticos, colonnades, and stucco statuettes all around, and in the niches constellations of gilt paper stars. Then, on the second stage, was a dungeon of Savoy cake, surrounded by many fortifications, in candied angelica, almonds, raisins, and quarters of oranges, and finally, on the upper platform, a green field with rocks set in lakes of jam, nutshell boats, and a small cupid, 
balancing himself in a chocolate swing, whose two uprights ended in real roses for balls at the top. Until night they ate. When any of them were too tired of sitting, they went out for a stroll in the yard, or for a game with corks in the granary, and then returned to table. Some, towards the finish, went to sleep and snored, but with the coffee every one woke up. Then they began songs, showed off tricks, raised heavy weights, performed feats with their fingers, then tried lifting carts on their shoulders, made broad jokes, kissed the women. At night when they left, the horses, stuffed up to the nostrils with oats, could hardly be got into the shafts. They kicked, reared, the harness broke, their masters laughed or swore, and all night in the light of the moon along country roads there were runaway carts at full gallop plunging into the ditches, jumping over yard after yard of stones, clambering up the hills, with women leaning out from the tilt to catch hold of the reins. Those who stayed at the Berteau spent the night drinking in the kitchen. The children had fallen asleep under the seats. The bride had begged her father to be spared the usual marriage pleasantries. However, a fishmonger, one of their cousins, who had even brought a pair of soles for his wedding present, began to squirt water from his mouth through the keyhole, when old Rouault came up just in time to stop him, and explained to him that the distinguished position of his son-in-law would not allow of such liberties. The cousin, all the same, did not give in to these reasons readily. In his heart he accused old Rouault of being proud, and he joined four or five other guests in a corner, who, having, through mere chance, been several times running, served with the worst helpings of meat, also were of opinion they had been badly used, and were whispering about their host, and with covered hints, hoping he would ruin himself. Madame Bovary, senior, had not opened her mouth all day. She had been consulted neither as to the dress of her daughter-in-law, nor as to the arrangement of the feast. She went to bed early. Her husband, instead of following her, sent to St. Victor for some cigars, and smoked till daybreak, drinking Kirsch punch, a mixture unknown to the company. This added greatly to the consideration in which he was held. Charles, who was not of a facetious turn, did not shine at the wedding. He answered feebly to the puns, double entendres, compliments and chaff, that it was felt a duty to let off at him as soon as the soup appeared. The next day, on the other hand, he seemed another man. It was he who might have been taken for the virgin of the evening before, whilst the bride gave no sign that revealed anything. The shrewdest did not know what to make of it, and they looked at her when she passed near them, with an unbounded concentration of mind. But Charles concealed nothing. He called her, My wife, tutoyed her, asked for her of every one, looked for her everywhere, and often he dragged her into the yards, where he could be seen from far between the trees, putting his arm around her waist, and walking, half bending over her, ruffling the chemisette of her bodice with his head. Two days after the wedding the married pair left. Charles, on account of his patience, could not be away longer. Old Rouault had them driven back in his cart, and himself accompanied them as far as Vassonville. Here he embraced his daughter for the last time, got down, and went his way. When he had gone about a hundred paces he stopped, and as he saw the cart disappearing, its wheels turning in the dust, he gave a deep sigh. Then he remembered his wedding, the old times, the first pregnancy of his wife. He too had been very happy the day when he had taken her from her father to his home, and had carried her off on a pillion, trotting through the snow, for it was near Christmas time, and the country was all white. She held him by one arm, her basket hanging from the other. The wind blew the long lace of her cauchois headdress, so that it sometimes flapped across his mouth, and when he turned his head he saw near him, on his shoulder, her little rosy face, smiling silently under the gold bands of her cap. To warm her hands she put them from time to time in his breast. How long ago it all was! Their son would have been thirty by now. Then he looked back and saw nothing on the road. He felt dreary as an empty house, and tender memories mingling with the sad thoughts in his brain, addled by the fumes of the feast, he felt inclined for a moment to take a turn towards the church. 
As he was afraid, however, that this sight would make him yet more sad, he went right away home. Monsieur and Madame Charles arrived at Tost about six o'clock. The neighbours came to the windows to see their doctor's new wife. The old servant presented herself, curtsied to her, apologised for not having dinner ready, and suggested that Madame, in the meantime, should look over her house. End of Part 1 Chapter 4「Chapter Five of Madame Bovary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert. Translated by Eleanor Marks Aveling. Part One, Chapter Five. The brick front was just in a line with the street, or rather the road. Behind the door hung a cloak with a small collar, a bridle, and a black leather cap, and on the floor in a corner were a pair of leggings, still covered with dry mud. On the right was the one apartment that was both dining and sitting-room. A canary yellow paper, relieved at the top by a garland of pale flowers, was puckered everywhere over the badly stretched canvas. White calico curtains with a red border hung crossways at the length of the window, and on the narrow mantelpiece a clock with a head of Hippocrates shone resplendent between two plate candlesticks under oval shades. On the other side of the passage was Charles' consulting-room, a little room about six paces wide, with a table, three chairs, and an office chair. Volumes of the Dictionary of Medical Science, uncut, but the binding rather the worse for the successive sales through which they had gone, occupied almost along the six shelves of a deal bookcase. The smell of melted butter penetrated through the walls when he saw patients, just as in the kitchen one could hear the people coughing in the consulting-room and recounting their histories. Then, opening on the yard where the stable was, came a large dilapidated room with a stove, now used as a wood-house, cellar, and pantry, full of old rubbish, of empty casks, agricultural implements past service, and a mass of dusty things whose use it was impossible to guess. The garden, longer than wide, ran between two mud walls with espaliered apricots to a hawthorn hedge that separated it from the field. In the middle was a slate sundial on a brick pedestal. Four flower-beds with eglantines surrounded symmetrically the more useful kitchen-garden bed. Right at the bottom, under the spruce-bushes, was a curé in plaster, reading his breviary. Emma went upstairs. The first room was not furnished, but in the second, which was their bedroom, was a mahogany bedstead in an alcove with red drapery. A shell-box adorned the chest of drawers, and on the secretary near the window a bouquet of orange blossoms tied with white satin ribbons stood in a bottle. It was a bride's bouquet. It was the other one's. She looked at it. Charles noticed it. He took it and carried it up to the attic while Emma, seated in an armchair, they were putting her things down around her, thought of her bridal flowers packed up in a bandbox, and wondered, dreaming, what would be done with them if she were to die. During the first days she occupied herself in thinking about changes in the house. She took the shades off the candlesticks, had new wallpaper put up, the staircase repainted, and seats made in the garden round the sundial. She even inquired how she could get a basin with a jet fountain, and fishes. Finally her husband, knowing that she liked to drive out, picked up a second-hand dog-cart, which, with new lamps and splashboard in striped leather, looked almost like a tilbury. He was happy then, and without a care in the world. A meal together— a walk in the evening on the high road, 
a gesture of her hands over her hair, the sight of her straw hat hanging from the window fastener, and many another thing in which Charles had never dreamed of pleasure, now made up the endless round of his happiness. In bed in the morning, by her side, on the pillow, he watched the sunlight sinking into the down on her fair cheek, half hidden by the lappets of her nightcap. Seen thus closely, her eyes looked to him enlarged, especially when, on waking up, she opened and shut them rapidly many times. Black in the shade, dark blue in broad daylight, they had, as it were, depths of different colours, that darker in the centre grew paler towards the surface of the eye. His own eyes lost themselves in these depths. He saw himself in miniature down to the shoulders, with his handkerchief round his head and the top of his shirt open. He rose. She came to the window to see him off, and stayed leaning on the sill between two pots of geranium, clad in her dressing-gown hanging loosely about her. Charles, in the street, buckled his spurs, his foot on the mounting-stone, while she talked to him from above, picking with her mouth some scrap of flower or leaf that she blew out at him. Then this, eddying, floating, described semicircles in the air like a bird, and was caught before it reached the ground in the ill-groomed mane of the old white mare standing motionless at the door. Charles from horseback threw her a kiss. She answered with a nod. She shut the window, and he set off. And then, along the high road, spreading out its long ribbon of dust, along the deep lanes that the trees bent over as in arbours, along paths where the corn reached to the knees, with the sun on his back and the morning air in his nostrils, his heart full of the joys of the past night, his mind at rest, his flesh at ease, he went on, re-chewing his happiness, like those who after dinner taste again the truffles which they are digesting. Until now, what good had he had of his life? His time at school, when he remained shut up within the high walls, alone in the midst of companions richer than he, or cleverer at their work, who laughed at his accent, who jeered at his clothes, and whose mothers came to the school with cakes in their muffs. Later on, when he studied medicine, and never had his purse full enough to treat some little work-girl who would have become his mistress. Afterwards he had lived fourteen months with the widow, whose feet in bed were cold as icicles. But now he had for life this beautiful woman whom he adored. For him the universe did not extend beyond the circumference of her petticoat, and he reproached himself with not loving her. He wanted to see her again. He turned back quickly, ran up the stairs with a beating heart, Emma, in her room, was dressing. He came up on tiptoe, kissed her back. She gave a cry. He could not keep from constantly touching her comb, her ring, her fichu. Sometimes he gave her great sounding kisses with all his mouth on her cheeks, or else little kisses in a row all along her bare arm, from the tip of her fingers up to her shoulder. And she put him away half smiling, half vexed, as you do a child who hangs about you. Before marriage she thought herself in love, but the happiness that should have followed this love not having come, she must, she thought, have been mistaken. And Emma tried to find out what one meant exactly in life by the words felicity, passion, rapture that had seemed to her so beautiful in books. End of Part 1, Chapter 5 Recording by Ruth Golding